Where is your trust? You know, would you be willing to put everything on the line for something that you believe? But this is a really good question to ask yourself, I think, in a world that is, that is divided by injustice and fear and all sorts of things. Where does your trust lie? What do you trust in? Well, today, tune into our living room sessions and we're going to explore some of this together. Welcome to the living room where it is our hope that we would all together find and explore some ideas together and, and that you would actually grow in your faith journey and be willing to ask questions. But regardless, right there in your living room or wherever it is in the world that you're watching, that right there you would be willing to grow. You know, it doesn't matter what faith background or tradition or any spiritual practice that you come even if you're not a believer and asking questions that's great you know we it is true that we are all better together regardless and if there is one thing that we can see from our world just this week it is that there is a desperate need to declare our humanity together, to pursue unity and community amongst and amidst indifference, um, you know, to, to, to be the voice of the marginalized and the oppressed and to collectively pursue justice and equality and peace and we are truly all, to be, all better together. So wherever you are right here now, welcome and thanks for doing some life with us here. You know, we're just a bunch of people exploring faith uh, and many of which just happen to live or be located near Kyneton in Victoria or the surrounding region. But over the past few weeks, we've been exploring a book in the Bible called Philippians. And we've titled this series, Mindful, with a hope to understand more about the Christian faith and what the author Paul, uh, Paul the Apostle, what he actually understood and offers to us about having the mind of Christ. And, and from that point, the mind of Christ, how that impacts everything about who we are and about what we do. And you can download the Mindful workbook that we've been working through and just jump straight into, into this week, which is week four, or even start back from, from week one and work through that. You know, download that, that Mindful workbook in the comments below or from our website at kintonbaptist.org. It just has a few really good questions just to dig deeper on your own with another or maybe even hopefully in a group that you might consider joining. Inside the workbook, there's also some really great opportunities for kids to think and just to have some fun with. And kids, if, if you're there, let me just grab your attention now. Just listen up. How are you going? How are you? School's maybe gone back for you. Look, I hope you've been able to track along week to week as Detective KT continues just to give us some clues as we learn more about the Apostle Paul and what he teaches us from the book of Philippians. But look, well normally Detective KT is out in the field somewhere on location, but today I think we'd better sneak up on her because I know that she's got a lot of work to do at the office. Now, don't make too much noise. Ready? Shh. Oh, hi. Come on in. I'm working from my home office today. I'm just getting a bit of work done. And I'm, I've been thinking about some of the things we've been finding out about, about Paul and how God just completely changed his life and how God made us and loves us and just wants the best for us. And how when we follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that we won't have problems or worries, but what it does mean is that we will have Jesus with us through everything. Which brings me to today's piece of evidence that I found. This box. And it says on it, Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. If this was a box for your treasure, what would be inside it? Would there be money, a device, 
a special present that you've been given or something, a toy that you love to play with. This is a small box. You might need to have something much bigger. What would it be? The possibilities are endless. You don't really need to tell me, just have a think about it. In Philippians, Paul writes, I hope that I will have the courage now, as always, to show the greatness of Christ in my life here on earth. I want to do that if I die or if I live. To me, the only important thing about living is Christ, and even death would profit me. The most important thing to Paul was Jesus. Jesus was his most valuable thing. In John 3.16, it says that God loves us so much that he gave his son Jesus so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life, will have heaven. Jesus is our greatest treasure. Other things might break or get lost. We might decide that we just don't want to use them anymore or need them anymore. Everyone gets to choose what their treasure will be what the thing will be that they value the most above everything else. In the Bible, there's a story uh, about a hidden treasure. And if you download the Mindful Workbook, there's some activities in there that help us to investigate that a bit more. So I hope you find out something new. Uh, thanks for calling by, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye. Well, kids, download those workbooks and just have a go, have some fun. Let me ask you, what's your treasure? What's your treasure? They're great questions for us all. What do you value and hold as important in, in this life? And it's questions like this that many of us, I think, ask. You know, as we explore Paul's writing in Philippians, he makes this grand statement, a statement that, that, that clearly outlines what or who um, Paul's treasure was in his life. And he clearly tells us what his life was defined by. He says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, and I asked Sam just to share briefly what that statement means to him. Uh, so I'm Sam Marwood. I've uh, been living in Kyneton for two years now and I grew up north of Bendigo on a dairy farm and um, spent uh, you know, 15 years in Melbourne and then finally f decided to come back to my roots in central Victoria. Uh, so I uh, it's a bit strange trying to figure out what I do, but I work with uh, environmentalists, with uh, people, in, people wanting to run businesses that do good for nature, uh, which a lot of that is farmers, uh, and trying to find business models around looking after the planet. So in the Bible, Paul the Apostle says, uh, to, for me, to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And, uh, and I think about that in two ways. One is that's an amazing statement to think that no matter what happens in life and uh, you are sorted and to know that if you die you're still sorted like there's there is an afterlife and you can keep going so it's sort of to me is a really refreshing and relieving concept that uh, if things go bad in this life or uh, you don't live as long as you'd hoped um, that ultimately there's a, there's a goal and there's an, a purpose after life Whereas the alternative to that is, you know, we, you know, the planets or the universe gets destroyed and we're all, everything is purposeless, which uh, to me is a really heavy thought. And I hope that, my hope and, and I want to look for evidence is that that is a true statement, that why is Paul so confident that no matter what happens, he's, he's all sorted. Uh, and I've been spending a lot of time, you know, for the last 10 years thinking about this from a philosophical point of view. What is, what is the evidence that God is real and that a claim like Paul makes is true? Uh, and, uh, and I've been doing lots of study and you can check out this on YouTube. I love, you know, every day I'm on YouTube <laughs> looking at debates around Christianity and, and atheism and, and finding out what's true. But for me, there's plenty of evidence that it's more true that, uh, that God is real than not. And then I've, this passage got me thinking about Pascal's wager, which is one of the things I've, I've learned about in this, in this in my study. Um, and he talks about, he so said, there's no evidence uh, for, for God either way. How do you make a decision around whether you believe in him or not? And he talks about, well, let's say there is, there is a God, but you don't believe in God. And that means you, you go to hell. But let's, let's, what's the other option? There is a God and, uh, and you do believe in God. Well, then you get to go to heaven. So that sounds that sounds pretty good, but let's say there isn't a God and you've believed in Him, you've, you have believed in Him, well, that means you've lived a good life 
for no reason, but at least you've lived a good life. Uh, but there is no God and you don't believe, well, you go to uh, the you know, eventual heat death of the universe and it's purposeless anyway. So out of that, it wages, wages that you're better off believing in God uh, if there is no evidence. Um, so to me, that's really sort of a powerful thought process to go through is, uh, is there evidence for God? Um, let's unpack that. Even if there isn't evidence for God, what should you be believing? And that sort of helps to me to ground this concept that, that Paul talks about where to, to live is Christ and to die is gain, that he's sorted either way because he's got this confidence that, that God is real uh, and therefore he's living his life uh, according to that. And for me to know that there is evidence uh, is critical uh, for, for me to base my life around the concept and that's what I'd encourage anyone to do is look at the evidence that's around to, to give confidence to a, to a claim like that. Thanks, Sam. And look, the evidence is, it's overwhelming. So it's no surprise as we consider the people from the Bible and still here today who have thrown all their chips in, so to speak. You know, people who have given uh, their everything to live out their lives with the mind of Christ in their gifting, with their passions for, for the work and for the advance of the gospel and just carrying out everyday normal lives. You know, the Apostle Paul, he made tents. You know, Jesus was a carpenter. Many notable men and women from Scripture and still today have huge, huge effect in advance of the gospel in their place or in their space. But holding the evidence in hand, they have rationally and faithfully decided to incline every aspect of their lives towards living out the mind of Christ in whatever vocation or context or capacity that they find themselves. And when it comes to uh, faith alive in everyday life, we each actually, I think, we, we have a decision to make. You know, are we all chips in? Are we 100% all in, so to speak? Well, as Sam points out, Pascal suggests if, if I were a betting man, you know, placing all my chips in the corner of Christ alive, there is no doubt that's the safest option. You know, that's a choice though for each of us to have to come to. You know, I pray that's the choice that you've actually taken or that you would even consider as we live with the mind of Christ. He, he leads us into all sorts of things. You know, for some, it's working and living here locally. You know, Christ in you, allowing His Spirit to work out through you in the everyday stuff of life. For others, it's in other places around the world. Um, but regardless, they feel compelled to plant themselves somewhere because we're all called to mission wherever it is that we find life. And as a faith community, we, we believe it's important to support those who need it. And as a church family, we get to share in the advance and the work of the gospel both locally here and around the world. And one of our mission partners is Phil Barnden, who, who many here in this region might know. But to update or even for the first time maybe to just discover a little of the work that Phil is doing and that we are supporting, let's just cross over to a conversation that Noel and I had with Phil a couple of weeks ago. Welcome Phil Bandon. It's great to have you on board uh, joining us here in Kyneton again. Uh, some folk here in Kyneton uh, will of course have met you and uh, you have been you have visited us a number of times now but there are many people here who, uh, who perhaps haven't met you. Uh, we as a group of people in Kite have been supporting Phil for quite a few years now and the work of symbiosis in Bangladesh. And of course, quite a number of our folk have visited Bangladesh uh, and, uh, and seen Phil there at work. So Phil, it's great to have you on board, um, even though you're not with us in person. Uh, we do appreciate you making the time this afternoon to, uh, to spend some time with us. So perhaps can you tell us a little what you're up to, what you're doing back here in Australia and, how, and, and uh, what your plans are? Oh, thanks for having me, Noel. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't come up and be with you guys present. Um, yeah, so my, I've been in Bangladesh for the past three years. Uh, came back just before Christmas. Um, and then the plan is to spend three years here catching up with people. And then the plan was to head back in July. But I think with the corona situation, that perhaps that might be delayed or probably delayed. Um, yeah, so 
the plan is to go back and spend another three years on uh, working there. But um, for the moment, I'm just catching up with people like yourselves uh, and talking about what we've been doing for the last three years and what we hope to be doing for the next three years. Okay, so perhaps Phil, can you tell us a little about what you have been doing for that last, I know your role has changed a number of times in, during that period, so what, what has your role been and, and how has that evolved say, during your last term? Um, yeah, so my official role is Community Development Consultant, so I work alongside um, the guys, the local guys who are in charge of our Community Development Program, um, the Chief Program Officer and Finance Officer. We run um, uh, some, a, a number of community development projects in rural Bangladesh. Um, the primary part of that is uh, self-help groups, um, mostly with women. So we, I think there are about 1,600 self-help groups with about 20 members each uh, across um, the north central Bangladesh. And we have about 150 staff, or maybe a few less now, um, helping manage those. And we also have some training programs and some health programs that we help. So my role is to try to help um, my colleagues with the way that we uh, design the projects that we run, how we keep a track of what's happening, um, and also how we report back to the people who provide us with the money, and how do we, can we, we can improve that. Um, and then I also have some roles uh, with providing things like tech support to my colleagues and also um, hosting some of the visitors who come and see what we do. Um, that's one of one of the things I enjoy most is getting to take pe taking people around and showing them what we do and how we do it um, and why we do it the way we do. So, yeah, walk, walking alongside the local guys who run the organisation and helping them um, be as effective as possible in what they do. And I reckon there were about t probably 20, 25 folk from Kite have actually been and uh, you showed around over there. It's certainly always yeah. been. I must admit, it's great to have, it's been great to visit when you're available. The last time we were there, you were, you actually, we crossed over, you were coming to Australia as we were arriving in Bangladesh and we missed yeah. you. Yeah, so very look, inconvenient that was. <laughs> I was wondering whether it was deliberate or not, but anyway, we won't um, go there. So I, remember, I remember one of, the, one of the visits that you came on, I think I was there for a day before you guys That's right. went on holiday. Yeah, that's right, you went over to climb Mount Everest or something. <laughs> well, I, I climbed to the bottom of Mount Everest. All right, okay. So, Phil, perhaps talk, can you talk us through just a little about how the work there has changed in that time? Because it has, it's quite significantly different now than it was, say, three years ago, isn't it? Yeah, so one of the big changes that's happened is we've had a whole lot of these, um, these groups of 20 women and working out a good way for them to continue working and doing the the good job that these little groups are in the families, that in, yeah, in those little communities they work in, how to make sure that they can operate without us um, so that we, in some ways, do ourselves out of a job supporting these groups. Um, and one of the main ways of doing this has been to connect the ones in local areas together um, and train them up to and help them become registered with government. So that be, many of these groups, say, uh, five to ten groups, maybe a few more, um, send a couple of represent, create an executive committee to represent them all and then get a rec, uh, registration with government and become community-based organisations. So that's been the, um, the main push over the last three years is to get these uh, groups working together and then building their capacity so that they can run by themselves and start new groups. So um, a number of these community-based organisations which, say, represent um, maybe 200 members uh, and their families have started, have gained registration with government, which means they have a lot more sway with government in terms of accessing, um, uh, say, allowances and stuff for the elderly in their communities or disabled. And they've also started um, creating new groups in their communities as well. So um, some of these women have learned to read and write as part of our program. Now they're helping um, other people start their own little self-help groups, saving money together, um, but doing loans, and then sort of uh, spreading this um, empowerment among the, amongst the communities they work in. So that's, that's been the main target, is how we uh, support these, these new community-based organisations as they try to impact the community, rather than working um, directly with self-help groups that have been around for a while. It gives us the opportunity to go start new ones somewhere else um, while we support um, through these community-based organisations, more of a partnership. 
Yeah, I think, Phil, that was probably the most impressive thing the last time I was there that I noticed was actually that change that have occurred. I think my first visit was 2012. Yeah. Uh, and then was there, what, what, over 12 months ago, um, or 80 months ago. Um, but actually to change for that very first visit when the groups were, you know, really starting to get established, but there was a, a very clear lack of confidence. But that empowerment of those women and those participants now is really quite extraordinary to see. And the confidence that's grown, you know, when they, they talk confidently, they, they're able to express themselves really well and in a very powerful way. And to me, I came home actually blown away by the transition that occurred between about 2012 and, 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 and to, you know, 2017 or something was um, five or six years later, that transition was just remarkable to see. So that must be really encouraging to you in your role. Oh, absolutely. Some of these ladies are very, very impressive in what yeah. they are able to achieve through some, through some, you know, um, some support from the organisation. So, um, and I think, as you put it, like the, the change in um, confidence between groups when they first start to maybe mm. six years later. Is, is significant. So the level of confidence in what they can do and what they can achieve. Um, you know, six years later, they they've achieved a whole lot of stuff with the loans and with the money that they've been able to invest. And then this next step has been this: um, what some of these groups have been able to achieve since they've been become registered um, and and become sort of this uh, this bigger organisation, this group of groups in a sense. Um, and some of the ladies who are running, you know. Who uh, the sort of the executive on these on these little organisations are very very impressive, um, not just because of where they've come from, but you know the fact that where they've come from is just even more so. They're very enterprising, so um, yes, yeah, very inspiring in, in yeah. terms of what they can what they can do and what they've been able yeah. to manage to do. Yeah, absolutely. But just in terms of the work going forward, whenever you do return, let's assume you get to go back middle of the year sometime, whenever that might be, when those borders are opened up again. What do you see as the greatest challenge for the next three years? I mean, obviously, funding is a real problem for the organisation, as it is everywhere, but I think yep. there's going to be so much emphasis on rebuilding our local communities and local... It's going to make it so much harder for organisations, you know, like Symbiosis and, and continue to tell your story... Is that that's obviously a big challenge, but what other challenges do you see going forward for the for the for the country there and the work of symbiosis? Um, I think there's there's I mean the COVID stuff will add to it. Bangladesh is um, will have will be hugely impacted by this, and where they sit, I think will will uh, when it dies down a bit will be um, very interesting, and and um, how that affects the the progress different people have made in terms of bringing themselves out of, of abject poverty um, mm. will be really interesting. Um, one of the challenges we've got in the next couple of years, I think, is we, we've we just started a new, um, or we're supposed to be starting a new project, starting some new groups um, off the back of a survey that was done a, a couple of years yeah. ago, identifying a new need and applying what we've learnt over the past six years, the past 10 years in running these projects how we apply that into this new one and how um, we keep a track of the changes that happen and how we can, um, I guess, uh, better show the impact of what we do um, will be an interesting challenge. Um, uh, the, the, some of the people that we're looking to work with are very poor, so um, mm. coming into it in a post-COVID-19 uh, world will be interesting and in how that impacts upon it, but mm. also given that we've got a, a clear destination in mind, which perhaps we didn't, we weren't as clear on in the past, yeah. how that impacts upon um, how we manage that and then also how we keep a track of what we do, particularly with um, the increasing access to digital uh, means of showing what we've done in the past and how we share those stories with people so they can get a handle on it and capture it. Yep. And then also how, we, how that affects how we deliver some of our our training and our support to our, our um, beneficiaries. So many people now have smartphones yeah, um, <laughs> and things like that. So how we can, um, how we can deliver our programs and, and activities in ways that are relevant and, and can make changes to, to these communities and how we integrate some other parts of the health components that maybe we, um, we haven't done as well as we possibly could have in the past. 
So it's just how we continue to improve upon the model and yep. what we've done well and how we find new opportunities to, to serve these communities, um, particularly in the partnership model. Now, given that we have these existing groups who are now effectively our partners, we're not um, yeah. um, delivering stuff to them now. We're working alongside them. Alongside them. That's a big change, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Phil, on a personal note, um, you're, you're at, at the lone Aussie working there at Symbiosis at the moment. How do you find that? How do you look after yourself living in that sort of environment? Because that must be a real challenge. A young guy like yourselves living in a country like that, uh, working on your own. It's not working on your own, but you know what I mean when I say that? Yeah, how do, yeah. How do, you, so, how do you look after yourself? So I've, I've been very fortunate in that um, uh, I have some family friends who uh, have been in Bangladesh for the um, for 40-something years, and they have um, uh, a great community around them that I've been able to join, which has oh, been right. fantastic. Moving to the capital has helped that. Right. Um, I also managed to recruit my brother to come and work in the country. So uh, I, I helped him find a job at a school. So um, now I have him, he's been living with me for the past uh, year and a half, two years. So that's right. been great. Okay. Okay. So um, having that, com that an expat community to, to keep up with, um, finding some le like leisure activities, playing tennis, um, has been really important. So I've been very, very fortunate in that. Um, and then the what other about part soccer? Is, I know you're a soccer fan, mate. you play soccer? No, not so much soccer. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been playing. I'm hope, I was hoping to play some here while I was here. So I've got my <laughs> soccer shirt, my, my local <laughs> club hoodie on. Um, but the, the, the opportunity to play soccer aren't as uh, easy. Right. So I've been playing tennis in, in, in Bangladesh. Um, that's I, I, did, I didn't realise they played tennis in Bangalore. I, I just thought it was soccer and cricket. That was it. Uh, the, the locals don't play a lot of tennis, but the foreigners do. So. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, so and, then, we, and then because language has improved, I'm able yeah. to socialise a bit more with the locals, which is yeah, great. Yeah, good, good. Um, Phil, I guess we, we're um, obviously we'll, we we want to continue to support you in any way that we can. And we were talking previously, we will try and organise perhaps a Zoom um, uh, opportunity for, for others to join us. But I want to really say thank you for joining us today. It's really good to to see you. It's good to hear your voice. And uh, and I'm sure, as, uh, the, I guess the benefit of COVID is that you can't return quite as early as you might. So we may get some more opportunities to catch up with you in the weeks and the months ahead. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully if... Uh if some of the restrictions slow down, I imagine that we'll open up before other countries open up. Yeah. So if, if there's an opportunity to come up and visit, you'd love to do that. We'd look forward to seeing you, mate. You know, the work that Phil and the team are doing is, is very, very exciting. It's also dangerous at times. There's no doubt that Phil would boldly proclaim, like Paul, for, for to me, to live is Christ and, and to die is gain. And I'd encourage you just to register for our weekly digital newsletter at kindtonbaptist.org because in the coming weeks, we'll all um, have the opportunity to jump into a private online webinar with Phil via Zoom just to really dig deeper into the work that they're doing. Uh, and it's quite amazing. But we're unable to sort of broadcast some of that content here publicly. But look, certainly register for that webinar and keep up to date via our digital newsletter you can stay tuned there but do continue to support Phil as a church family we make large financial commitments to support our global mission partners but look I, I just wanted to spend a moment on a few verses in the book of Philippians in chapter 1 verses 19 to 30 and I'd encourage you to read it this is where we find this amazing statement from Paul for to me to live is Christ to die is gain and I think at a first glance when considering this statement we could think that Paul's emphasis could could actually seem to be the, the triumph of life after death, spending eternity with our risen Lord, as the Bible prophesied and as Jesus promises. And look, and that's the ultimate joy that we, we all look forward to, although I suppose we do anything that we can in our power to sort of push that day back and to cling to this uncertain life. But 
Paul might want us, I think, to better understand the first half of this verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ. You know, in real deal down to earth terms, what, what, does, this, what does this kind of mean? Well, we could say, for to me, to live is my job. Uh, is my kids, my recognition, my, my health, my bank balance, my knowledge, my fitness, my security, my pleasure, my whatever. Yeah? One thing we've seen whilst living through isolation over the past few months uh, is that our lives are framed by activities. Most of them essential, yeah, yep, but some relational and, and some other. But for Paul, his life isn't centered around activities, not at all, but rather it's centered around Christ first and foremost. In fact, for Paul, we can see in verse 22, and we see right throughout all his writings actually, that he considers his life to be one of uh, fruitful labor for the gospel. This was clearly Paul's practice, not a new concept since arriving in Rome where he writes this letter. This is how he lived his life after placing his faith in Jesus every single day. You know, we read in the book of Acts that he worked as a tent maker. His aim was always to be as self-sufficient as possible. And his life would have been filled with, with, with similar responsibilities to all of us plus some kind of rather exceptional tests and trials along the way that we can read throughout the epistles particularly. But yet now, at the twilight of his life on earth, as he writes this, he joyfully declares his, his life motto for to me, to live is Christ and to die, it's just gain. You know, I wonder if we need to possibly change our thinking. You know, do we really want to put Jesus first? You know, that wouldn't make you super spiritual or anything like that. No, it would just make you convinced of the truth that Jesus promised. But more importantly, here in this life, you would get to live that out now, like Paul. You know, like Paul, we are to live with the mind of Christ, so connected that we'd, we'd find Him in the natural, everyday stuff. We'd seek Him for every direction, for all of our help, for everything. And quite simply put, we need to learn to just enjoy Him, to, to practice the presence of Jesus in everyday, simple life. Then... Maybe the fruitful labor that, that Paul mentions would actually flow from this intimate relationship with Jesus. We'd be so much more aware of, of his leading that we'd be ready and able to actually minister to those that he brings across us and in our paths and our lives every day because he does it every day. But you see, Paul, he doesn't stop there. He goes on in Philippians chapter 1 verses 23 to 30 and he touches on a another matter very very dear to his heart and just as important and it's the topic of unity and more than that unity in the body of Christ the, the, the people of God you know it's not possible to have true relationship with Jesus without true unity in the church in, in the people of God you know you cannot say uh, oh look I love Jesus with all my heart yet not have the same desire to be at one with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And more than that, to be at one in, in the redemption of all people. Not possible. You see, Jesus' prayer during the Last Supper, the night before his crucifixion, and you can read about that in John chapter 17, verse 21, but Jesus prays that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. You see, unity, it defines Christianity, or at least it should. And if we all understood this and carried this out, you know, if we all understood this and carried it out, the, the, the ensuing witness to our world would be phenomenal. Unity is the very, very core of the gospel. Unity and the good news of Jesus, the gospel, it's, it's inseparable. You know, 
All the church's strife down through the ages can be traced back to the breakdown of unity. You know, and I want to suggest that without unity, the church cannot grow into, into the maturity that actually God desires it to, to have. And so the lack of unity is like a cancer that just erodes from deep within, spreading out to destroy life. You know, so then Paul continues in verse 27 and he says to us, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. You see, in Paul's words, Whatever happens, there seems to be some urgency before he goes on to declare, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then I will know that. It's as though we have to learn to live our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ before we can stand firm in true unity. And what is unity? One God, one spirit, one man, one woman, one people before God. You know, this is the only way to live a true life and celebrate a flourishing community. The alternative is a fragmented and, and divided body. You see, it's not about our... Uh, interpretation of the finer points of scripture or our position in the body of Christ. It's not even about our preferred way of doing things. Rather, it's about us working together as one with Christ first, central and foremost. And it's from this point that we can truly declare for to, for to me to live is Christ one faith one body. Let me leave those thoughts with you. Download the Mindful Workbook and just take some time to consider what that means for you. Ask yourself some questions. And look, don't hesitate to ask any questions if you need help. You know, inquire about a group or, or whatever. Comment below or contact us at kindandbaptist.org. But until next week, God bless and go well.